Well, friends, a very warm welcome to our fourth seminar on science for the green economy. And um, great to see you here. We're a, a small select audience, but uh, fabulous to have you here this evening. I'm Simon Pollard. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor at Cranfield for Energy, Environment and Agri-Food. And um, Science for the Green Economy is a partnership between Cranfield and Herbert Smith Freehills. And it's, uh, I guess, our response to give a, an authoritative technical and legal response to the green economy debate. This is the fourth of our, uh, our seminars. We've so far addressed um, carbon capture and storage, big data, big environmental data, um, water demand, and this evening, uh, food waste. Um, and of course, food waste exposes all the apparent incongruities of uh, environmental law and policy, along with energy. Um, a whole set of mixed incentives and uh, disparate objectives, one might argue, at the same time. And I guess this evening we want to bring, try and bring some coherence to the debate. Um, just in the last week, we've had the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee urging government to give more funds to RAP to support um, their, their work on, their continued work on food waste. We've all seen uh, Love Food, Hate Waste campaign on the television, I'm sure. And uh, supermarket waste, retail food waste remains under considerable scrutiny, notwithstanding their... Um, their 10% uh, reduction in, in, in food waste between 2007 and 12. So we have three colleagues to uh, explore this debate with us, Leon, Phil and John. And um, the format of the presentations is short and sharp presentations and then Julie will kindly run a Q&A for us at the end of the evening and then there's an opportunity for some networking. So with that, can I introduce Professor Leon Terry. Leon's our Director of uh, Agri-Food at Cranfield. He uh, is the, uh, the leader of our agri-food business and runs one of the largest plant sciences laboratories in Europe. Over to you, Leon. Thank you, Simon. Okay, so um, I've got a prop, which is an a apple, which uh, most of you probably eat one of, one of, those, of those a day. Um, and, but there is more, more to, to it than just eating it. It's actually the effort that goes into producing it, um, uh, moving it, storing it, um, and I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about that in a minute. But I suppose a question for you is, um, how long do you think the maximum time um, that you can store an apple for, for is? What, what, weeks, months, anybody? How, how many months? No? Okay. So this apple, we could store this for eight months. And there's a huge amount of te technology, science, and understanding that need, needs to be put in, in place in order for us to do that. And it's, it's, there's, there's sort of a, a slight sort of di dichotomy in the fact that we're, we're told that um, uh, uh, we need to eat fresh, fresh food, but this apple can be eight, eight months old. Um, some apples can be stole, sold, uh, stored for 12 months. Nothing wrong, wrong with them. And actually, man has been trying to develop te technologies to store food for a number of reasons. The main, the main reason is that if you don't store, store food, you basically have what you are given from the land. And um, at this time of year, that would be potatoes, beet, beetroot, sprouts. Pretty boring, really. So. There is a bias towards R&D, um, towards primary food um, production. These are three uh, reports that have uh, come out since two, 2011, 12, 13. And one of the arguments that we're making to, to government and some of the government funding agencies, and they are starting li to listen, is that actually uh, this bias towards primary food production needs, needs to be um, uh, tempered a little and that there needs to be more, more e effort than there is, is now on developing um, science and te technology to uh, underpin trying to reduce waste. And the reasons for that is um, if we reduce waste, we're not, we're not con constrained by some of the um, uh, primary issues, for example, soil or soil quality. We're not uh, con constrained by um, water. 
Now, I haven't put energy here because we are con constrained by energy because in order to keep this apple for eight months, there are a number of hurdle te technologies you can use, but the primary one is to keep it cold. Okay? But that does, and that cl clearly does, d does take um, energy. But what we're try trying to do at Cranfield is to try and um, re relook and re engineer how uh, the preservation of food is um, carried out. So there's been a huge amount of work that has been talked, that, that has been uh, dis de described about waste, and there's a waste agenda that has really been driven by people like 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 Rap and others. And there are figures banded around that 30 to 50 percent of uh, the food that that we grow is actually wa wasted. Now some of that food <coughs> will always be waste. Okay, so let's not try and kid ourselves that we can't that we can actually reduce waste to nothing. The other thing is that most of the data that is um, uh, in the pub public domain is extremely poor. Now, I'm not saying that waste is, food waste is not a problem. It is a huge pro problem. But it's, it's about, as a, as a um, scientist, I'm always keen to look at what the methods, uh, the methodology that has, has been used to come up with some of these numbers. And in, in the main, most of the methods are very, very poor, or they are not, not clear. And when we try and delve a little deeper into this, it's, um, it, uh, the, so we don't actually know what, what the scale of, of the pr problem is. And actually, in my mind, there has been too much talk about how bad the pro pr problem is. The real key is about what we're going to do about, uh, about it. The fact that there is 30% or 40% or 50%, who actually cares? It's actually about, well, what are we going to do about to reduce it to 10% 10, 10 or 20%? 20, 20 so I'm going to concentrate mainly on fresh pro produce waste because that's, that's where the levels of food, food waste tend to, tend to be higher. And it's about quantifying uh, what, what the waste is, how much waste there is, what are the causes of that waste, and where that waste happens. And until you know those, those are, are answers, or some of those answers, it's very difficult to do anything about, uh, about it. And there are four things that we really need to focus on when it comes to fresh produce waste. The first thing is to understand the, the biology. This is a living thing, okay? It is dying. And we are trying to lengthen its, its life. So when you're eating in uh, to an apple, you're killing lots and lots of cells, okay? But that, that means in order for us to understand how we might preserve life, we have to understand those, those life pro processes that are taking place within that apple. The other thing is, is how that product is grown and how that product is stored. So there's often a, 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 a mismatch or a, a, a lack of, um, uh, a lack of uh, uh, linkage between pre-harvest pre con conditions and post-harvest storage. So we know that if you um, apply a mild stress to many plants, it tends to um, it tends to extend um, storage life. But there, because there is such a drive on yield, and the, the fact that many fruit products are sold by, by weight, there is a, there is a, a sort of a, di a dichotomy there. The next thing is about the te technology. So there's been a huge amount of agricultural en en engineering in primary production. But actually, there's a lot more that could, could be done on trying to extend post-harvest storage life. And in order to do, to do that, you need to understand the biology. So you, you have to have the en e engineers working with the biologists. And critically, the fourth thing is, is, is the management. And this is often overlooked by scientists and te technologists in the fact that we need to... Um, there is no, no point, for example, extending the storage life of a, or, or the shelf life of a of a product when you can guarantee you, you have a um, a clear idea of what the demand is 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 going to be. So, for example, bananas, a, a very a very important fruit. Nine out of ten shopping trips within the UK will contain bananas, and so and the demand stays flat pretty much throughout throughout the year. So you know that if you can deliver the right amount at the right the right time, the level of in in store waste is 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 going to be relatively low. For something like salad crops, strawberries, 
and so on, where the con consumption and, and the demand is governed a little bit more by the weather. So, for example, when the sun com comes out in the summer, demand for strawberries can go up by six, sixfold. And that's where you actually need te technology to buffer um, post-harvest life. So if you look at supply chain management, this is um, uh, taken from uh, about 2,000 two years ago. So how, how we used to preserve food from uh, Kerala, um, taking it um, through the, the, uh, uh, the Middle East to Rome, was basically to dry it. So take that water activity out, and you can there th therefore extend storage life because you will reduce uh, the uh, issues related to pathogen load. Now, if we take it forward to 1866, um, many of you might, might know about, uh, about this. This is uh, the great tea race in 1866, and this is when two uh, vessels similar to the Cutty Sark um, sailed from Shang Shanghai to the Thames. It took them three months, and uh, the winner, the tai Taiping, was only half a day uh, quicker than the loser, and uh, the winner won a million pounds, which then was a lot of money, and that, and, and that was full of dry tea. Now, what we're starting to do, to do now is use some of these te te technologies that have been developed for, to preserve post-harvest life of apples and other products onto other plant you know, commodities, showing that we might not ha have to dry, dry, dry them, and this uh, means that we could get uh, better bioactive life as well as, well as post-harvest life. This is sort of the modern day where the amount of food that is tra tra transported across, across the world has, has, has in, it, it increased hugely. But it still takes, for example, 28 days for a vessel full of uh, South African plums to reach the U UK. It takes 45 days from Chile and so on. And there are various and very s sophisticated te technologies that are put in, it, in place to preserve post-harvest life. So I've talked a little bit about the management. What I'm going to talk about, about now is, is some of the te te technology. So um, obviously there are lots of fa facets of how we might preser preserve life. Um, one of the ways, for exa example, is to uh, uh, produce or, or create te te technologies to um, e extend storage life. So we uh, developed a new ethylene um, scavenger uh, with colleagues in Johnson Matthey, which is a FTSE 100 company that many of you would be aware, would be, be aware, uh, aware of. This is a precious metal com company that's been going for about 250 years. Um, and, what, and what we did with them is that um, we, there was a, uh, um, a view that we could um, potentially use uh, platinum group metals to extend post-harvest stor storage life by controlling ethylene. So ethylene is a very simple gas. Um, most um, green, mo most bananas that arrive from uh, uh, Central uh, America um, and so, so forth will be picked un unripe and they will travel two weeks by ship until they reach the UK and then they'll be treated with ethylene gas and that will elicit them, or, or, um, elicit them to um, uh, become ripe over a period of four, four to five, five days. That, so thus it's critical to control the level of ethylene within the, those type of products. They're, they're called climacteric fruits. That includes things like mangoes and pap papaya and, and so, so on. There are other types of fruit that are, are called non-climacteric fruit, and these are, are known to uh, or, or, were, or were, were believed to not, re, uh, to not respond to ethylene. So if you control ethylene, it doesn't e extend storage life. However, the work, the work that we did with uh, Johnson Matthey and created this um, patent, uh, which is then licensed out to a, 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 an SME called It's, it's Fresh, and this is a, a product that is now sold in uh, Tesco, Carrefour, Co Costco, um, in, in every corner of uh, the globe. And we've shown that we can extend uh, storage life or shelf, shelf life by uh, strawberry fruit by up to two, to two days, which is a massive um, in, it, it, it increase, almost double um, what we would find. And the effects of that on post-harvest waste have been pr profound. Now, this was first done through a PhD student pr project, uh, which started in two 2006. 
and it actually turned from a PhD studentship to a commercially launched product in 2011. So it took five, five years, which is an extremely quick turn, t turnaround. And this is an article from the Guardian, I think, in uh, two, 2012, demonstrating that uh, these pads, they look like sticking pl plasters, you'll, you'll uh, see, see them in, in, in certain packs can uh, reduce waste. So the last part, part of my talk is to, to really um, raise the, the problem of human capital. So there are, there are very few people like me in the world. Um, thank you, Simon. Um, now, and that, and that, is, that is probably a good, a good thing and a bad, a bad thing, depending on whether you're uh, speaking to my mother or not. But it's, 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 the reason why I mention it is because in terms of the number of post-harvest science, scientists, there's probably about 600 of any note. So if we're talking about 30 to 50% of uh, um, food being, being thrown, th thrown away. <coughs> There's a huge problem there in terms of uh, human cap capital. And this is especially relevant in sub-Saharan Africa, Pakistan, in, 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 in Nadir, and so, so on. So rather than talk about, about the problem, we've actually done some, s something about it. So we've set up the World Food Preservation Center. This is a, uh, which was set up uh, last summer. This is a collection of, of uh, eight University, I think, I think it's actually 13 now, uh, with with one major university in each in each of the world's continents, and this is to um, train up and educate um, specifically uh, scientists from sub-Saharan Africa, and um, to understand and um, uh, then be be able to deal with po post-harvest waste than th themselves rather than rely on other people people. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. Thank you, Leo. Thank you. So thanks, Leon, for giving us uh, a bit of insight into the complexities of the supply chain and uh, some of your work. But what about the sort of technological response and giving value to waste? So Phil's now going to pick up. Uh, Dr. Phil Longhurst is our reader in environmental technology at Cranfield. He's worked in, in waste and resource management for much of his career, indeed doing much of his work on uh, Greater London's waste. So, Phil, might I ask you to speak? Thanks. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Leon. <coughs> yeah, I've tried most of my life to dig my way out of waste, in fact, so it's great to talk to you about it <coughs> before I escape from waste. Um, what I'd like to do very briefly is talk about what's referred to as valorising waste, which is how do we get value from what will inevitably arise in the food, food production process? Um, in particular, what I want to really do is cover two things. One is implication for food waste recovery. So we're going to get food waste arising throughout the supply chain. So are there better ways of dealing with that? And then secondly, look at food transport itself as a wasteful process. So <clears throat> our familiar with image with food waste, and in fact um, we try to get over the tone of what has been a very successful message of love food, hate waste, is really that cutting down on food waste is about doing less, eating less, eating leftovers, perhaps having a slightly more miserable time, a bit less fun, certainly not an expanding perspective on a growth market and which is completely contrary to what the retail sector is trying to encourage us to do with food, which is buy more, increase our diversity, enjoy food more. So there's a clear conflict between the saving, the, the reduction of waste, and what we're actually being much more strongly told to do, which is go and buy more. Buy one, get one free, buy another packet, try a different supplier. So we've clearly got to look at something to deal with the inevitable arising of waste. And if, if technical changes took place as planned, or certainly as we're hoping to achieve, then we could have a whole series of initiatives, certainly in terms of more food collection schemes, more anaerobic digestion plants, and I'll come back and look at those in a moment, better acceptance from food producers about the use of products from AD. <coughs> and then we start to look at the implications of infrastructure around initially the UK and then around the world in fact, local energy hubs. So we're really trying to replace the image of waste 
from food as being something that can genuinely be avoided at all costs to something that we actually need to have an underpinning infrastructure and a way of thinking that that infrastructure will exist alongside the food production process. So I think there's really two opportunities and I'll sort of focus on those two areas. One is the logistics, getting waste back along the process. And then secondly, the recovery technologies, what we do with it as it's produced. And then lastly, a sort of strap line underneath is, what do we do with the risks? How do we accept that there is risks to both these processes and what might happen if they go wrong? Like not pressing the button. So more AD plants and dealing with food waste mountains. And this is a very, very typical image of a compost waste site, which in its, in its own right is not a bad process. It's producing quality soils, but there's more that we can do from this process. So if we look at the logistics and the energy component of food waste overall, <coughs> this is a big issue. Um, about 90, just under 100 billion pounds in terms of the agri-food chain, supply chain. 3.3 million jobs, 188 billion pounds consumer expenditure. And if we look at that in terms of what that looks like in energy, the food production supply chain is about just under 180 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. That's quite a lot in terms of, it's about something like uh, between, well, I've said 18% of total energy use. That's not just the production, that's the logistics, the supply, the chilling, storage, using the technologies, advanced technologies of looking at s preventing the waste along that supply chain. And that's a major challenge regardless of what the oil price does. So if we want to get energy back and invest in energy systems, it's got to be something that's stable regardless of what, whether our petrol price is fluctuating up and down. There's, of course, legal implications in this in terms of the way we frame our policy. So on the right-hand side is an illustration of how energy, non-food, and food contributes to our um, UK carbon dioxide emissions. So there's our 17 18% from food. And you can see how it carves up on the right-hand side between, broadly, the large chunk of agriculture, fairly good chunk on, on transport, <coughs> but a lot on home and food-related emissions. But if we then look on the left-hand side, we'll see, in fact, the protein sector, the red meat, 30%, and the dairy products, 18%, are making almost half the total load in CO2 emissions. And if we think of that in a global context, as we look at the um, expectation of world population around 9 billion, and an increase in prosperity, we're seeing an increase in the protein production, so protein demand. So not only will that, that, that total CO2 emission go up, we will be in competition for that protein globally. So if we think of competition right now, uh, if I explain this chart in a second, um, if we think of food waste arising inevitably as it happens, we're producing food waste, we're collecting it, and we're paying for that disposal. And we pay a set price for that disposal and there's three lines on this chart. The bottom line is in-vessel composting. And what that line is showing is that it's going from, this is a minor scale, so it's going from about 30, I'll get my maths right, arithmetic right, about minus 33, so that's costing us initially about 33 pounds to throw away food waste down that type of process. And the costs have gone up, mainly because it doesn't give us any money back. We just compost at an expensive process and lose the value. The top line is composting in open air. It's around £24.50 is costing us, and the costs have slightly reduced. The really interesting one is anaerobic digestion in the middle. It starts at around £33, £32, £33, and the cost has reduced. Why is it getting cheaper for anaerobic digestion? Well, the reason is people are earning money out of anaerobic digestion processes, so there's a market competition for the food waste. There's a food waste war, if you like. People are prepared to pay or accept food waste at a lower gate price because it's becoming harder to get. Now, at the moment, we have about 170, 180 anaerobic digestion processes in the UK. There's about 400 that have approval 
in design, approval and planning. When those come online, we can expect this line that's only January to December last year to, s to show another shift. So that market is currently only being held in place by the feed-in tariffs, what I've called FITs for food, the feed-in tariffs for the food industry. So what we would expect is the gate price to further drop and government subsidy to uphold an element of the anaerobic digestion sector. Quite a challenge if you're investing in AD plants because effectively you've got a turf war for security of your supply of feedstock. But having said that, there is a real opportunity. We're losing huge volumes of food waste. And the real opportunity is can we capture more food waste along that supply chain? Can we avoid those large compost piles and can we retract and recover that better? Now we can do that if the technology and logistics improve. And one of the things that we've seen perhaps more, more this Christmas than ever is the start of integrated supply chain for products other than food. So if you've done click and collect for John Lewis, you've bought your iPad Air for your partner, you've clicked and collect and you've, you've recovered it from your grocery store. You didn't venture outside, you didn't change your shopping pattern from anything other than your normal food shopping, but you came home with electronic products. What if that were to happen with food? What if the largest household delivery sector, the fastest growing delivery sector in Europe, which is household delivery of foods in the UK, were to start recovering food waste? And if it was to start recovering food waste from the household back up the supply chain in a safe and secure manner? That recovery of food waste, which has been tried and has shown significant concerns and scares of recovering potentially pathogenic food back up the supply chain was dealt with technologically, then we start to have a better system for recovering that nutrient and energy rich material. So to do that, the technologies we need have got to be rather more complex, advanced integrated vehicle designs, internal product designs, better food storage and better recovery. So there's the potential for changing vehicle designs as long as they protect health, they achieve health protection and hygiene. That incurs a greater opportunity for anaerobic digestion. We start to capture that food waste supply, not just at the household, but from the retailer, from the distributor, from the farm, and right back up the supply chain. And that starts to improve our energy connections. Now that could be stimulated by a change in tariff, change in value, incentives along, rather than just taxation, which is easy to say, but if a, comp if a government's going to use taxation, they want to see real leverage. But incentives to do such a system. And that would help us decarbonise or reduce the carbon emissions as part of our supply chain. Another element in the technology which we've not yet started to see on anaerobic digestion plants is to take the carbon rich gas which is half CO2 half methane and start to decarbonize that at source and produce hydrogen as a fuel and start to store the carbon. So trials are underway but that's a very early step we're probably looking five ten years away but you can start to see the supply chain has real potential along such a route from a purely technological perspective. But what else is on the horizon? Well we've seen self-drive vehicles um, and we started to speculate, well, OK, I need a taxi. I'm going to phone for one. It's going to arrive without a driver in it. It'll take me to where I want. When I finish with the vehicle, it will drive away. But we've not sort of started to think, what about shared vehicles, shared supply chains? So companies, albeit we've seen companies go bust before Christmas, logistics companies, there are many successful companies.